Hello and welcome back to World Traveler Commentary. Now, um, I've decided to do a series on how and why Western um, academics and politicians have grossly misunderstood, I think, the run-up to and um, geopolitical realities surrounding the war in Ukraine. Um, and I've decided to start with John Mearsheimer, largely because of his popularity, and also because um, the disagreements I have with Mearsheimer's um, uh, narrative about the run-up to the war um, is very much based upon very specific um, facts and behaviors on both Russia's and the United States' side. Um, I think Mearsheimer is largely correct on the outlines, but the details on which he's, in my view, quite wrong are ones which uh, have grave implications for the ability to solve this conflict going forward. So let's start with Mearsheimer's thesis. Mearsheimer's thesis has to be understood against his larger theories um, about uh, the instability of unipolarity in the world. Um, so Mearsheimer's unipolarity thesis I've already covered in the end of liberalism, um, but the basic idea is that when you have a hegemonic power, the use of hegemonic power undermines that hegemony, both in terms of political resistance at home as well as abroad. Um, and therefore, unipolar worlds are necessarily unstable and uh, don't last. Instead, he sees political realism as being um, the natural state of things in the way that everything eventually moves back to a world dominated by great powers, both regionally and maybe, you know, uh, hemispheric. Um, but not, and maybe even some world powers, but not, you know, the single um, uh, all-powerful United States that we saw from, uh, I think the, the timeline he puts it is from the Soviet Union's um, collapse through, um, uh, from the Soviet Union's collapse uh, really until the election of Donald Trump, which he sees as the end of um, American hegemony. Um, so his views have to be taken uh, within that larger framework uh, of his work. Um, I think his thesis relating to the end of uh, global liberalism is quite correct. Um, and therefore his basic thesis is, hey, you know, what happened after the end of the Soviet Union is that the United States decided, hey, look, we control the world. Uh, we're going to make, we're going to remake the world in our image, um, and consequently they put in place many different institutions, including, for example, the World Trade Organization. Um, and the end result um, of this was this idea that the United States could do anything they wanted. Um, the expansion of NATO then uh, along Russia's border then is an exercise of continuing to remake the world in America's image. The US was extremely successful, I might add, at liberalizing Europe after the end of the world war, uh, after the end of the, sorry, the, the end of the Berlin Wall, where um, uh, largely in Western Europe, non-Marxist socialisms gave way to um, very strongly liberal states. So, um, and to a large extent also, uh, strong liberalism of Eastern Europe. Uh, and so basically what, um, what Mearsheimer then th says is that um, the watershed moment in 2008 when NATO said, we agree that Ukraine and Georgia will become part of NATO, then becomes the reddest of red lines for Russia. Um, 
and Russia finds various ways of dissuading that. Um, in the end, Mearsheimer then argues that despite not being a NATO member, Ukraine was basically being turned into a de facto NATO member, whatever that means, because, I mean, in my view, unless you have Article 5 protection, you're not a NATO member, right? Um, and that this was the reason why this, uh, this happened now. Um, there's certainly a lot to the outlines of this story. Um, the history of Russia is one of being perpetually invaded from the West, and so the military encroachment on Russia's borders is going to raise alarm bells, as has generally been pointed out. Um, one in seven Russians then alive died in World War II. Okay, so um, that's the level of destruction in Russia in regarding the German invasion of Russia, which is very, very difficult to imagine in the West. Um, this is a level of destruction that I think um, uh, didn't exist among any of the other allies, for example. So, um, and then before that, a hundred years before that, you have Napoleon's invasion, you know, time before that you have various invasions from Sweden, which is why uh, Russia took over Finland and from Sweden and gave them autonomy and created Finland in the first place. So Finland exists uh, originally as a Russian um, buffer state to uh, prevent Swedish uh, incur uh, invasions into Russia, for example. Um, so, uh, but Mearsheimer's thesis then breaks down when we start looking at details. Um, the fundamental problem here has to do with um, the fundamental fact that NATO does not want a direct war with Russia, right? And everybody knows this. It's not a closed secret. It's not a... Um, that, that, that's not even a subjective judgment. The, the fact is um, the United States and Russia generally don't want to be in active conflict with each other because then you have a very serious risk of nuclear war. So, how did Russia respond in 2008? Well, the first thing that they did was they ended up in a war with Georgia, which was the other country that was mentioned in that declaration. And um, there, there were a bunch of things that had gone on back and forth, but one aspect of this war was um, the proclamation that Georgia would join NATO and the uh, U.S.-led military exercises in that country. So, Russia comes in, effectively begins to sort of occupy, if you will, Abkhazia and South Ossetia, which are majority Russian uh, parts of Georgia, and this sets up a situation where if Georgia were brought into NATO, it would be a de facto declaration of war by NATO against Russia, and therefore Georgia can never join NATO. Um, so I think you have to start from there. Okay, then you have to understand that uh, after twenty, after the Maidan um, revolution, I'm going to come back to that because that's. Maidan, I think, is way more significant than Mearsheimer gives it credit for, uh, and way more threatening um, to Russia's uh, security interests than uh, Mearsheimer gives it gives them uh, gives it um, uh, credit for. Um, but after Maidan, Russia then does something which prevents Ukraine from ever joining NATO, and that is that they take Crimea. Uh, as long as Russia and Ukraine, both claim Crimea, Ukraine cannot join NATO. The reason being, nuclear powers are not going to offer Article 5 guarantees 
to a country which is in a de facto frozen war with Russia. To do that is to effectively declare war on Russia, not going to happen. So uh, this puts Ukraine in the position of either having to give up all claim to uh, Crimea or just simply not having any path towards NATO membership. So my point here is I think it's quite obvious that um, that Russia understood the dynamics well enough to recognize that their actions in Georgia and uh, in Ukraine in 2014 ruled out a path to NATO for those two countries. So Mearsheimer's thesis breaks down um, in the argument that continued integration with NATO was the actual reason for the problem. Um, so, what really was going on? So, let's go back to the whole Maidan um, business. The narrative we're typically told is that Yanukovych was pro-Russian, um, anti-EU, had been negotiating with the EU, but then just decided, hey, look, we're not going to get a good deal, we're going to go with Russia instead. Then everybody said, hey, we want to go with the EU instead, and had a bunch of protests, and eventually Yanukovych left and was replaced by um, some sort of an interim government. Um, while nothing in this statement is necessarily false, there are a larger number of things which are missing. The big one is that Yanukovych had been negotiating quite deeply with the uh, European Union in a large number of ways. And in fact, um, the 2012 language policies had been um, reviewed and eventually approved by the Venice Commission, which is the Commission uh, on Law through Demo or Democracy through Law. Um, so the United uh, so the European Union had been deeply involved in helping the Yanukovych uh, presidency craft policy for bringing, uh, for creating a state uh, in Ukraine for all Ukrainians, and regardless of what languages they speak and things like that. Um, I don't believe the European Union was involved at all on the Maidan um, movement. The United States, however, quite clearly was. Um, the thing you have to understand about uh, Ukrainian politics is that, like many countries in the world, and Ukraine isn't unique in this regard at all, there is a 2% fringe which can be fairly described as neo-fascist. Now, I have a great piece on uh, what is fascism, I suggest watching it. Um, this isn't mindless name calling. Um, this is I, I'm speaking about a very specific um, political phenomenon. Um, that two percent fringe ended up with large portions of cabinet members, including in very clear uh, important places. And it's also worth noting that this particular two percent fringe had a track record of street violence against minorities. Um, for example, in 2010, you had um, an attack that, they, that, that uh, the Social uh, National Assembly bragged about, uh, where they went to a market and beat up a bunch of uh, um, uh, basically um, various people of various um, ethnic minorities, including Roma, um, Vietnamese, um, and others. So this group had a history of street violence. They were using that street violence in Maidan. They got into power partly because of this. And the first thing that they do is they tear up the EU negotiated language policies from 2012. All while saying we want to move towards Europe, but they actually start moving Ukraine away from Europe. Um, I think that I think that one aspect of this has to do with the fact that you almost certainly have um, an agenda from the perspective of the United States um, of undermining the European Union. 
Um, we talk about European allies, the United States um, doesn't really like to have allies in a bidirectional sense, they like to have vassal states. Um, that is what it is. Vassal states that they can sacrifice at the altar of their own hegemony, like they're doing to Ukraine right now. Uh, so, the, the second thing is that this aggressive anti uh, sort of de-Russification policies, which started there and then continued under Poroshenko and also under Zelensky, um, amounted to uh, basically a sufficient oppression of ethnic minorities that you ended up with um, you ended up with significant Hungarian um, uh, resistance to this, including passportization of Transcarpathia. Um, Hungary was sufficiently successful at this that, that Hungary was able to force Ukraine to ch change their citizenship laws and recognize dual citizens because otherwise people were just choosing, were just grabbing Hungarian passports if they qualified and then this was giving them um, uh, an additional illegal citizenship in Ukraine uh, and this was a problem. So, this gets them to the civil war in Donbass. Uh, if you're in a minority and you're having all these problems, um, and you rise up and you know you're able to, you know, there, there's a lot of evidence that the initial arms for the Donbass rebellion actually came from the Ukrainian military, not the Russian military. Um, there's also some evidence that as things continue to go forward, uh, the Russian military was involved in providing additional arms. So, um, so what you have here in my view is almost certainly an initial uprising that very quickly turned into a proxy war between the United States and Russia using Ukraine as a battleground. So, in this theory, the United, uh, NATO wasn't turning Ukraine into a de facto member of NATO. The United States was engaging in a proxy war against Russia on Russia's border. Now, that's a very different kind of security threat than this, the one that Mearsheimer talks about. And it means that you have an inability, in my view, for Ukraine to negotiate their way out of this because Ukraine themselves is uh, being used as a tool um, for um, the U.S. to maintain its own hegemony. Now, instead of... Um, now, what I believe is the goal here from the United States perspective, now that the war is going on, is to draw it out for as long as possible and basically have as much of a um, guerrilla war as possible, hopefully tying up, from the perspective of the U.S. global planners, uh, as much Russian forces as possible to keep them from doing mischief like preventing U.S.-led regime change wherever the U.S. wants to do it. Um, that's, of course, a reference to Syria. Um, and the big thing there is that Syria was a humiliating defeat for the U.S. as outgoing hegemon. I don't think that, uh, I don't think that, um, the U.S. is willing to tolerate a country which can go in and protect, um, the legitimate government of that country when the United States says, hey, we don't like you, we're going to change. You have to change governments. So, from my perspective, this looks like a situation of the United States goading Russia into a, well, first of all, creating a proxy war and then setting up a situation where Russia has very little choice but to get involved and then trying to tie up as many troops for as long as possible. Who cares about the Ukrainian casualties from that perspective, right? They don't. I do, 
I want to see a negotiated end to this. Uh, but I don't see that happening because the United States doesn't have credibility in negotiating wise. Um, the U.S. has been withdrawing from every treaty they can uh, in order to create security threats on Russia's border. Um, the, re the withdrawal from both the anti-ballistic missile uh, treaty and the Intermediate uh, Nuclear Forces Treaty both do that. And those treaties uh, were there to effectively reduce the likelihood of a global catastrophe in the form of a nuclear war. So, um, so the United States has been doing this. The United States has no credibility because, you know, if you make a treaty with the U.S. today, they will withdraw from it as soon as they see it as in their advantage. So why would you do that? Um, Ukraine can't negotiate their way out, um, and so my fear on this is that what we're going to see is we're going to see um, Russia eventually take um, Ukraine up to the Dnieper and probably giving Ukraine the option to surrender and keep Odessa. We will see what Ukraine does with that. Um, and then possibly take all of, the, all of the portions of Ukraine that used to be part of Russia proper, leaving those portions which have been part of Poland and Lithuania. Um, basically the Poland-Lithuania Commonwealth, uh, Grand Duchy, I think. Wow. So that's my prediction as far as what's going to happen. Um, I wish there was a better way out of it. Um, I think that this has been very much a matter of U.S. policy being focused at preventing a resurgent Russia threatening U.S. dominance wherever the U.S. wants to project power. Um, and now the U.S. is facing a situation where they don't have the power to match Russia in the way that matters, right? Um, it doesn't matter what forces you would send into Ukraine right now, as long as they're non-nuclear. Um, the United States military has specialized in defeating weak opponents. We do not specialize in fighting big land wars, right? And so this is a situation where um, and the U.S. doesn't want to go on to war footing because that would be unpopular. So I see this as something which is inevitably going to lead to a Western defeat, a U.S. defeat, and uh, where there's really no opportunity to negotiate your way out of it. So that's my view on this. Um, let me know what you think in the comments. Um, I'll probably pick up... Um, uh, sort of one of the more liberalist uh, viewpoints next on the series. So, um, have a great day. Um, certainly, let's all hope that, that this, well, I think that this war will wind down um, and that it will just simply be a battlefield defeat for the West. But let's hope that that's what happens, that it doesn't escalate into a nuclear conflict, because that would be bad for all of us. Have a great day. Don't worry about things too much. Talk to you.